Now, as an aside, um, there's a lot of concern about salt, and I'd just like to present this paper here. So, big paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, over 100,000 participants, followed them up for almost four years, and they measured how much salt was coming out in the urine versus your chance of dying, something we call all-cause mortality. So this is the graph. So what we can see here is, uh, running up the side here, this is your chance of dying from any cause. And on the bottom here, this is how much salt you are excreting in your urine. So we can assume that your salt intake must have been at least that much. And what we see here is that the lowest level of mortality was somewhere between four and six grams of salt a day. If you had less salt than that, look what happens to your risk of all-cause mortality. If you've got two grams of salt a day, that's about double the risk of dying from any cause. So uh, when we're talking about salt, it's critically important, especially if you're on a ketogenic diet, because you have to understand, ketogenic diet means low levels of insulin. Your body's not holding onto that salt. So a lot of people will actually find that to avoid the symptoms of keto flu, they actually need to increase their salt intake into the diet. Triglycerides. Now, clearly, all the epidemiological data out there says if you have a high level of triglycerides in your blood, your risk of heart disease is increased. And uh, this graph here demonstrates their association with diabetes and, by proxy, insulin levels. If you have high levels of insulin, as seen in diabetes, you have high levels of triglycerides. Now, to understand why you have high levels of triglycerides, we first of all have to understand that the liver can store glucose as glycogen, but only up to a point, 100 grams. After you flood the liver with sugar and it reaches its capacity, it has nowhere to go, it can't be stored. So instead what happens is it starts this process called de novo <coughs> lipogenesis. De novo lipogenesis means you'll produce fat, you'll produce triglycerides. And this is a very elegant study where they said, we're going to give people more carbohydrate than they can burn, and we'll see what happens. So on day two here, you'll see that they burnt that much of the carbohydrate, and they, test, they measured that through some fancy techniques, and they turned this much carbohydrate into glycogen stores. Now, what happened on the next day? Because their stores were quite full. They probably burnt a little bit of glycogen, but there wasn't that much room. So they burnt a bit. They burnt a bit more, actually. They stored a bit of glycogen, but then they started to produce fat. And as the days went on, and you can imagine that this is happening every day to people on the standard Australian diet. They're giving their bodies more carbohydrates than they need. And this process, lipogenesis, making triglycerides, is occurring. You put in more carbs than you can, and because you have insulin resistance at other tissues, the sugar can't be taken up that effectively in the, in the muscle anymore. It has to go somewhere. Part of it goes here, and it forms fat. So if we have a look here, this is the liver. We make this fat de novo lipogenesis. So what happens? Then it gets exported. Remember these VLDL particles from the last lecture? They're holding triglycerides. Enters the circulation. Bang. You now have increased triglycerides in your circulation. We know HDL is good. If you have high levels of HDL, it is a very good indicator that your risk of heart disease is reduced. Now, the problem is that we can see the triglycerides can be taken up by the HDL <coughs> molecules. And through various pathways, if the HDL molecules take up too much triglyceride, it ends up leading to their breakdown, their catabolism, hence a reduction in HDL. So the same mechanism that causes an increase in triglycerides also eventually leads to a reduction in your HDL level. 